Welcome, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Money Talks. Uh, thank you for being here. My name is Hugh Meyer with Charles Worth and Rugg. Uh, just to remind everybody to, uh, uh, to check out our, our YouTube channel, Money Talks. Hit the like button and uh, all the podcasts will be available on Apple and Spotify and Google. Again, you know, why we're here, Money Talks was developed to be a place where we could bring on elite thought leaders, entrepreneurs, successful business owners to help talk about what has made them successful, uh, how they have done that, and how they have managed to deal with a lot of the difficulties that COVID-19 has brought here, uh, brought on to us here um, in 2020. And, you know, this is meant to be a resource for everybody. Uh, that's what we're trying to do at, at CNR is be a resource. And all the guests that are coming on are great people, and they want to be a resource to you as well. Uh, so with that, we want to get right into it. I want to introduce our guest today, Stephen Mead. Stephen, thank you for being with us. Sure. Um, I'm going to uh, let you take it away. You can give, uh, please give the folks a little bit about yourself, a little bio, and then we'll, uh, we'll get right into the presentation. Yeah, perfect, Hugh. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. And uh, I've, I have the arc of entrepreneurship introduction down. I've been doing this for years, either fortunately or unfortunately, but uh, I'm officially now known as the bullseye guy, which is why I have the little logos up and, and I'll explain how I got there. Uh, I've started 11 companies, five of which I'm the first one in the world to have ever done something. And whenever you start out with that, people immediately go, I don't believe you or prove it. So retail stores in college, when I was in Kansas City, I owned watch stores called Time's Up. When I was 20, I wrote a book called Give Yourself Credit. And I created an infomercial. So as best we can tell, I had the third or fourth infomercial ever on television with a guy named Kevin Harrington. And the funny part, because this is an entrepreneurial podcast, Hugh, and we have a, a little more time than normal, I wrote one book. But there wasn't this thing of, but wait, there's more that you always see now on television. So we were selling books and tapes and I needed an upsell. The book had three chapters how to improve your credit, how to apply for credit, how to budget your money. I split three chapters and put a cover on. So I claim I wrote three books. I had one, but I needed, but wait, there's more. You know, so I, I learned a lot about infomercials, direct response in my 20s. The arc of my career really started when I was 22. I went to work at Travelers Group, Sandy Wild, Pete Dawkins, Joe Plumeri. In the span of six and a half years, I read 357 books. And you tell people that, excuse me, they like, that's impossible. I like, no, everything's math. The goal was to read one book per week. I was a sales trainer. So I would read a book, dissect the elements out that I could teach my sales force and read that. So a book a week in six and a half years is 357 books. It's not that tough. You just had to commit to it. But over the course of that time, I trained probably 8,000 salespeople. Wow but I developed a technique, a system called a bullseye belief system. And that's some of what I'll, I'll, I'll get to and talk to today. And it's, it's hundreds of books and thousands of hours. And it's all of these really unique, practical, implementable sales techniques that I've used through the course of the year. So I started an internet company in 96, became the first master merchant in the world, credit card processing, took it public in 99. It's Technically, kind of what became PayPal. We were the master merchant that convinced Visa to change the laws to let us process internet orders in 96. Did a Homeland Security product in 2001, internet software, enterprise software, mobile technology. Fast forward to today, I like putting these big epiphany things out. We have a, a blockchain company right. called Mineta Pro. And my joke is people go, are you blockchain? I'm no more a blockchain company than Hugh, you're an internet company because you're using a website and a podcast. So blockchain to me is an enabler just like the internet was. Right. But we've got a global marketplace trying to create a global currency, which was the same idea I had back in 2001 and nobody in the world understood it. So I don't give up on ideas. I tried to build a global currency in 01. Nobody understood it. Now we're launching one in a different format. Uh, so yeah, I've done these kind of unique companies. I start them all myself. I have to figure out the messaging. I have to figure out the market. I have to figure out investors, customers, board, advisors. So 
the technique that I've developed this bullseye belief system, I've used to develop 11 companies, three public, five were the first one in the world. But it's really good information that's easily translatable right. to other people in business, regardless of what they're doing. It's great. Uh, so with that, Stephen, um, do we want to get started and kind of go through yeah. some of the bullet points, and then we can uh, we can start dissecting away? Yeah, and what I what I offered to do, Hugh, and thank you again. I've got a PowerPoint. I'm not big on oh, let's do a presentation, but this one's really cool. It's super visual, a lot of fun graphics. It's 45 or 50 minutes of information, sometimes an hour and a half. I'm going to do it in about eight or nine. So I'm going to flip through really super fast, but the reason is that'll give Hugh, you and I time to actually make this more interview format, not preachy. Yes. But anybody that wants the presentation, I'll share it with you. They can get it anytime they want. Thank you. Um, which, which makes it really super cool. So I'm going to go old school here, jump into a share screen, and we're going to jump in. Can you see it? I can. So bullseye belief system, why isolation is a good thing. And it's funny because I'll talk about isolation. The minute you say isolation, people immediately think being alone and negative, and it's opposite of that. So here we go. Super fast. It's designed to be fast. Don't go, oh, he's going too fast. This is on purpose. <laughs> Three types of speakers, in my opinion. Inspirational. Hey, here's my story. Look how great I am. Aspirational. If you do these things, you can be cool like me. Education was do these things and you could potentially be better. I'm educational. I'm not aspirational. I'm not going to motivate you. I'm going to say, here's what you can do word for word. Isolation usually means being alone. People go, oh, you like being alone. I, I, I didn't say anything about being alone. But we think negatively. We're programmed to think negatively. I can reprogram your mind in a quarter of a second. This is, again, getting into the techniques of how we, especially as salespeople or business owners, have to reprogram the thoughts we tell ourselves. If I show you that picture and ask you isolation, if I say, ah, isolation is a good thing. If you just thought of that picture every time of isolation, it completely changes the dynamics of how you feel, what you feel, the story. So pictures and visuals are critically important. One of my favorite books is called What to Say When You Talk to Yourself. It's a $5 book. I, I recommend it to everybody when they're starting out. You have to reprogram your thoughts and pictures and visuals, and it's super easy. So isolation to me is about specific target focus. Again, a bullseye. A bullseye is about being specific, this one's kind of cool. Again, I don't have time to do it, but I don't even know if it works on Zoom. The, the, the circles kind of swirl. Yes. And what I do with everybody, Hugh, I say, all right, I want you to pick a dot and stare at the dot and tell me what happens. And again, if I have enough time, you stare. The dots stop moving because you focus on a particular dot, the whole thing stops. And my point is, I don't tell you which dot to pick. I don't care what your goal is. Pick a goal and focus on it, and everything else around you becomes irrelevant and stops moving. Right. And so that's what the bullseye belief system is. It's a way to focus on customers, funding, talent, relationships. It doesn't matter. It's how can you be specific. And it's the be, do, have paradigm. What do you want to have? Everybody's like, oh, I want to be rich. I want this. Well, you want to have those things. What are you willing to do? I don't know. Well, there's certain things you have to do to have the things you want but you have to be the kind of person willing to do the things to have what other people want. So it all starts with this process. This one's great, especially now with COVID. People are like, what do you think about COVID? I'm like, I don't care. All I can control are my actions and my attitude. I can't control what the market's doing. I can't control if COVID's coming or going. I can control my actions on a daily basis and my attitudes towards them. That is the only thing I have control of. And when you get and understand that, a lot of the other spinning things become irrelevant. It's not that I don't care. I care, but I worry about what I can control and my right. attitude towards the things I can control. What does success look like? Most people think, oh, he's so successful. Well, it's usually pretty messy how you get there. 
Which road do you want to take? Alice in Wonderland? This one, this one's kind of funny. Most kids in college, not everybody's seen it. So some of my slides are not age appropriate, but sometimes they are. If you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And this to me was a little more modern than the Alice in Wonderland. Um, know your vision. Again, the, the, this is a speech I give, so some of these things may not be relevant, but I like them. In the South, this goes over well. Here in California and LA, not so much. It says know your vision. If you're a leader, people are following you. If you don't know where you're going, you know, when you start building a company, it's not just you. Other people become reliant upon you. Right. So it becomes important for you to know where you go. I like the GPS metaphor. You don't just get in a car and go, right? You pick a route. That's your bullseye. But you follow GPS the first time you're going somewhere. The second or third time, you kind of know where you're going. But eventually, the knowledge and experience is you don't need GPS. You may use it just for traffic, but with experience, you know you can turn quicker. You got to gain experience. But you have to know where you're going. GPS helps you there. That's kind of what targets are. What are these people doing? This is always a fun one. Everybody thinks they're climbing up a mountain. They're actually rappelling down. It's easier to go down than up, which means you have to start at the top. I'm, I'm almost there. We're moving through pretty quickly. When you ask people, what do you do? I'm always confused. People just go on and on and on. Oh, I do. I, I don't get what you do. I don't understand it. I don't need to. People are like rock stars. Again, Hugh, this is a fun one. I bring somebody and say, hey, I whisper in their ear a song and they knock. And the song I almost always do, this is my trick, is Star Spangled Banner. Oh, say, can you see? When you're knocking that, nobody in, in the audience knows what it is, but in your head, you hear the song perfectly. That's what happens when we tell people what we do. We're a proprietary closed loop platform using car, like, like everybody has their own terminology that they right. know perfectly in their head exactly what they're saying. Nobody else does. So the, the, the technique, the actual bullseye beliefs technique, this is one of them, is what's the emotional value of what you do, right? With what you're doing, Hugh, with financial services, there's something cool about what you do. Then what are the best industries, right? And when I was doing insurance sales, I knew what my market was, 25, 45, married, kids, employed, own a home, like that, that's it. If I'm in sales, I'm trying to say, hey, here's the best industries. Here's the companies. Here's the title of the person I sell to. And here are the five names of the people I want to meet right now. Do you know them? Because what you do is irrelevant. Like I, I don't sell software. I talk to the CFO of Maersk. I'm trying to get to the president of Ford. Like right. what I do is I talk to this guy. I don't sell software. But you have to move people down through a sequence where they can help you. You know, and, and I'm not going to go through all this, but basically this is Mineta Pro. What's the emotional value? We, it's a $17 trillion market. We're in industries like airlines. Here are the companies we're interested. We talk to the CVFO or the procurement officer, and here's some people I'd love to meet. And within your network, if you use this the right way, even if you're doing sales, if you're doing financial services, insurance, attorneys, you can say, oh, I can do anything, but what are the industries I'm best in? Where can I be really effective? And if you notice on here, I'm asking for United, I'm asking for airlines and United Airlines and the CFO. I'm not saying, oh, I can, like, I don't help pizza companies. I don't help a shoe company on the corner. But if I tell you I want the CFO of United Airlines, you might say, I don't know that guy, but I know the CFO of JetBlue or American right. or Air So I get what are called horizontal introductions. I've set the stage in my target of asking for exactly what I want. And this one, I'm, I'm only going to spend a little time here. People think being specific limits your options. And it doesn't. The more targeted you are, it opens your options because then people yep. go, oh, I know exactly. I'd rather tell 10 people exactly what I want and who I want to meet and get introduced to three of them than have 10 people send me a bunch of stuff that I don't want or need. So this aspect of 
knowing your customers, set your goal, be specific. This is where people as business owners really need to spend the time. It's, it's your responsibility to know your best market, your company, your target, the, the five people you want to meet. Not my job, it's yours. And so we kind of did this with Mineta Pro, which again, I like this as an example. I looked at the 2000 largest companies in the world based on assets. Because Mineta Pro is a trade platform, corporate barter. I could, I could sell to anybody, but I'm like, no, let's get a target. 2000 companies on assets, not sales, revenue, employees. How many of those are in the top 10 industries? My target industries, airlines, automotive. Now, and you can see 987. Then I found evidence of 88 that had a history of trading. I found press releases. The press release gave me two companies, the type of trade and the name of the individual who took credit for that. Out of that, there's 47 of the biggest companies in the world I had direct relationships with. And then I said, which of the 15 do I know the best? Which ones might be early adopters? And, and I sort of came down and said, here's my list of the 15 target customers. There's thousands of them around the world, but here are the 15 I want. And then people give me horizontal introductions. One of the other things is, is called take meetings early and often. A lot of times we build software, we build companies. We're not ready. Like we were talking to IBM a year before we were ready. But I go in humble saying, hey, Hugh, we're building this cool new financial services platform. Here's what we're doing. Tell me why won't it work? One of my favorite questions, why won't this work? What am I doing wrong? Who's my competition? Who else is doing something similar? You know, I want to elicit negative feedback and negative information and have you feel comfortable to give me negative feedback. I don't want to go and go, no, oh, here's what I'm building. Isn't it great? And in the back of your head, you're like, this is stupid. Right. Or we would never do, or there's 10 guys doing the same thing. It's like, why won't this work? How can I get better? What would it take to one day do business with you? So I'm a big proponent of taking meetings early. Uh, experience is the best teacher. It's also the slowest. Mm. You know, that's why we learned early on this aspect of reading books. That was years ago. Today, it's so much easier. There's internet. There's, you know, podcasts like what you're doing, Hugh. There's so much content you can get that really accelerates your learning curve and make things more effective. Um, and that's it. There's a bunch of other techniques and systems and things that are in there, but just from a, a pretty quick standpoint, that was it. And then the things down here are just different sectors and industries and companies. This, this kind of bullseye technique, we just built some basic templates for, so anybody that's in sales, financial services, insurance, real estate, this just sort of says, here's a, a, a template system you can use. Great. That's great. And I will come off share and there we have it. Thank you. Uh, that, that was excellent. I, I, I'm sure that's a, an amazing and can be amazing resource for, for a lot of folks. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of good questions I'm going to, I'm going to ask, but I love the fact the idea, idea is specificity, you know, like you said, focusing on who your target is. Everyone's so focused on throwing as many darts and in many different directions as possible with that idea that their percentages are going to be better when in actuality, that's not very efficient. Yeah. It's not an efficient use of time. And you're not directing your message to anybody. You're just sending it all over the place as opposed and to being specific as to what you do and how you can help that end yeah. person. And, and I agree with you. And that's where, again, this it's over my shoulder, this one. If I can tell you the emotional value of what I do, all I need you to remember is Mineta Pro is cool because it helps, you know, companies do barter or companies do trade. But what Stephen really needs is CFOs in these companies. I need you to remember, I think what he does is cool and here's who he needs. If I have 10 people that know that, right. I will get referrals out of half of them. And if I do that consistently, I end up with more referrals in my target than 10 people who I said, hey, you know, send me referrals. Like that was the worst when we, when we were in the insurance sales side, you know, we're competing against everybody else. Oh, well, hey, you send me referrals. And 
I created something called Steam. Because again, I was actually recruiting. And I said, what are the best characteristics of somebody that would come to work for us? Right. And I, I developed Steam. So I would say, you know, who, who do you know in sales? And, and again, negotiation, a bunch of those techniques weren't on there. When you ask a closing question, you shut up and wait. Like the guys at Pawn Star are brilliant. You want to pawn it or sell it? Sell it. How much do you want? They give you a number. You always flinch. Oh, how about X? You know, you want $1,000. Oh, I'm not, you know, how about 600 And you shut up. So when we were trying to get referrals, who do you know in sales? Who do you know that's a teacher? Who's the most enthusiastic person you know? Who's the most ambitious? Who's the most money motivated? And the goal was targeting specific attributes to try and get you to isolate a specific person or name because I didn't sell insurance. I talked to people, right. but here's the people I want to talk to. That's, yeah, I bet that's... that's excellent advice um you know a ton of a ton of resources already from uh from the time we've been speaking and so now yeah i have a few questions um you gave me some more information when we spoke initially um mm -hmm. that i thought was it was great for me to learn about and, and, I, and i'm sure people who are going to be listening to this will want to will want to get a better understanding of you talk about um kind of building on a skill set and and creating, you know, and answering the question, what is financial independence? Can you maybe elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, so the, the, the whole bullseye belief system, the one I just showed you there was really a lot around just step three, oddly enough. Step one of my 10 steps, and again, not to plug my own, Hugh, but I've got a podcast out where I've really gone deeper on this for anybody yeah. that wants it. But, but to your question, step one of my 10 steps was design your destiny. People don't know what they really want. And they don't know what kind of job and they don't know what kind of company and they and a lot of times they make decisions based off of financial. Right. Right. Oh, I can't do this or I can't. And so what I learned is you have to remove the financial parameter from from your decision process. But to do that, you had to build a story. So directly to your question, I would do this and again very quickly. I would ask a question, have you ever thought about being financially independent? And people say, oh, of course. Well, what does that mean? Oh, it means this or that, or oh, it means paying my bills or not having to worry. That, that, that's not specific. That's not a target. So I would walk them through and say, financial independence means specifically having enough money saved to live off of the interest to maintain the lifestyle that you want to have. So I'm going to say it again. It's very simple. Having enough saved to live off the interest to maintain your lifestyle. The problem isn't number one or two. Those are parameters you can get to. The problem is number three. People don't know what their lifestyle is. They don't know what their dollar amount is. They don't know what it takes to maintain. Do they want to buy a new house? Do they want a car? Do they just want to be able to pay their bills and not have to worry? So you have to spend time on your own saying, what, what does financial independence mean to me? How much money do I want? How, I had something over here. I thought I, if I could find it, I would have shown it, but I don't have it anymore. So it's okay. How much do I want to have? So if my standard of living, and I'll use easy round numbers, they could be big, I don't care. If my standard of living is $10,000 a month, and I say that, my parents would laugh at me. We grew up in Kansas City where it's, you know, 2,500 or three grand's a lot. I'm in LA mostly, Beverly Hills. You're like, oh, 10 grand. But if my, if my number's 10, right. multiplied by 12, that's 120,000. I like to round up, it's 150,000. I probably can't earn six, seven, eight percent interest. So if I multiply 150,000 times 10, if I had $1.5 million saved, and did some, some smart things with, with where I put that money, I could probably generate interest income to be able to maintain my standard of living. So my dollar amount now becomes $1.5 million that right. I need to make or save. Then I do this interesting thing, Hugh, called a shift, because what you learn, again, when you read all these books, psychology, People think money's bad. It's, it's the weirdest thing. People are like, oh, I don't need that much. Oh, well, well I don't want to be greedy. I only, I, like, no. If you're going to work hard, 
if you had more money, what would you do for others? If your parents are alive, what would you do for your parents? Would you buy them a house, retire them? Would you buy, oh, I never thought about it. I'm like, well, think about it and be specific. Would you buy them a car? Yeah, I'd buy them a car. What kind? Well, I don't know. Well, think about it. What kind of car would you buy? How would you deliver it? Would you tell them? Would you not? Would it just show up with a big ribbon on it? Do you want to be there, not be there? Surprise, like visualizing what you would do for others pushes money away from it being egocentric to, wow, if I had more, what could I do for other people? Right. Again, one of my sayings, and I, I, I took it from somebody along the way, I'm sure I'd love to give them credit. Money makes you more of what you already are. If you're an ass, you're a big ass with money. If you're insecure, you know, you can look at this with some of the most famous people in history, the, 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 you know, Michael Jackson's of the world, the princes, if you're insecure, you become more insecure. But if you're generous, you become more generous. Right. So money is designed to make you more of what you are. You need to be a good person. That's where that be, do, have thing comes in. It all stacks. But yeah, if you figure out your dollar amount and then shift to make it bigger and figure out what you would do for others, what would you do for charities? Would you be a secret Santa, niece? then the attainment of money doesn't become evil. And that's what was so frustrating is, you know, even today we're stuck in this environment where billionaires are bad. Bill McKinsey Bezos just gave away $1.7 billion. You know, okay, yeah, Jeff, I've met Jeff many. Jeff's worth a lot of money. Great. You can't give away $2 billion if you don't make it somehow. Right. You know, and, and, and it's just, it's this weird dynamic where I think you need to shift what you do for other people, which again is step two of my 10. What's in it for you? What's in it for me? Trying to figure out how to add value. Right. Um, but to finish, so under that step one is what's your financial independence number? What would you do for others? Then if you had that amount of money saved, now you're not making decisions made based on money. What do you want your life to be like? And this is especially true for entrepreneurs who have all these ideas and don't know how to pick. If you're standing on a mountaintop 10 years from now, deep breath, look around, visualize, I've got this money, I can take care of my family. What do I want my life to be like? What kind of people do I want to be around? Do I want to build a company or a business? There's a difference. A business is you know, up to 50 people. A company might be 50,000. Right. The time, effort, commitment, family, like it, it's, they're just different decision paths. Do you want a product or a service? Do you want to travel or not travel? Like some people love traveling for vacation, work, travel and vacation travel are not the same. So if you can make these decisions and say, what do you want your life to be like? then you make decisions as an entrepreneur based on outcomes of where you want your life to be. Right. Not do I want this job or this job? Thank you. That was great. Super helpful. And you actually alluded to my next question. Um, you talked about yeah, the, the concept of, of an email and uh -huh. you know, we, it's such a huge part of, of what we do, whether it's personally or professionally. But as far as the professional side, talk about your, your thought process that you and I spoke about as far as sending an email, which obviously in this day and age right now is even more important. Yeah. Can you talk about that. Yeah. And, and again, I, because of time, this is great. So step one is design your destiny, financial independence, which we did. Step two of these 10 steps, I'm not trying to oversell it because I don't sell it. I give it away. So it's not like I'm trying to constantly go, oh, hey, here's another tidbit. Go buy. I don't have anything to buy. If you want it, right. it's free. But step two is Wifu with them. Wifu says, what's in it for you? What's in it for me? How do I figure out, Hugh, what you need? How do I figure out what you need to be valuable? What you need to be successful? All right, and I'll answer your email question, but I'm going to reverse engineer into it. Again, over my shoulder, emotional value industry. Step three is that technique. Step four is called deflect, defer, and disclose. Step five is called the reverse technique. 
And step six is called psychological jujitsu. So I'm going to get to him very quickly to come back to your direct question. Right. Thank when you. I meet somebody and I do a lot of business networking and they say, oh, hey, Stephen, what do you do? That's a trick question. I mean, Big Bamboo, we've got four companies running. We've got this. I, I, I'm not going to give you the information because I don't know who you are or what you do. So I deflect. Like, oh, we just run an incubator. But Hugh, tell me more about yourself. So I deflect away. I answer it where you think you've answered. But I didn't really give you anything to glom onto. But your brain doesn't know that. Your brain thinks I answered. And now I'm asking you a question. So your brain says, oh, I should answer. And in networking events, people love to talk about themselves. So now I'm in control. I've gained control of the conversation by deferring back to you. Saying, oh, Hugh, tell, tell me what your company is. But I, and this will sound harsh, doesn't, I don't have time to figure out what you do. And I probably wouldn't understand it anyway. But right. if I want to help you, which again, what's in it for you, I reverse engineer the questions. So I'll say, oh, Hugh, like, tell me what's cool about what you do. Or what are your, what's the one thing your clients love about what you do? I'm trying to figure out the emotional value. Oh, totally. Cool. What are the best industries? Like, are there one or two industries you're really good in? Where are you strongest? Like, what companies are you trying to get to? Oh, who do you target in that company? What's, what's the title? I can reverse the questions to sequence you down to what you need because you don't know how to tell me how to help you. It's the old self-improvement thing. I have to help you, help me to help you, help me, help you. So as I'm going through this, I'm trying to develop what do you do that's cool? What do you need? Who are the people you're trying to get to? Because if I can help you in the company or the title of that person, I may want to do it if I like you. Right. And then the psychological jujitsu is basically when you don't, and, and this is called stepping on. If you ever talk to somebody here and they're like, oh, oh my God, do you know this person? If I'm asking you those questions, you might say, oh, I want to meet. So, oh, do you know this person? Do you? I don't ever, if I can, jump in and go, do you know, do you? I make mental notes like, oh, he needs that person. And once I get to about five, my, I tell people, hey, my mental pegs at five. Let, can I write a couple of names down? So I'm making mental notes of people I might introduce you to. Then this is psychological jujitsu. It's actually called referral currency, but it's actually psychological jujitsu. I'm building a referral burden on you. If I say, hey, Hugh, this was, was cool. Here's a couple people come to mind that I think might help you. Let me tell you about them real quick. Here's it. And I'll give you one, two, three names. Does that make sense? Are those people you might want to meet? If, if, if I'm good and know the people and done, you're going to go, yeah, of course. Great. No problem. Hey, let me tell you real quick what I do. And I, because I reversed the tornado on you, I know what you need, but I also can position what I do, when I deflect and defer, when I finally disclose what I do, I can disclose my background of what I do want and need based on what I now know about you. Right. So it allows me to go into a room and sometimes I might give three, four, five different answers of what I do and what I need based on who I'm talking to. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So that what's in it for you, what's in it for me, but out of that became the follow-up email, which is what you're referring to. And traditionally at these events, it's like, oh, dear Hugh, you know, I met you at the event and I talked to you here and I did this and I, you know, and, and, and I talked to you in the corner or I talked to you about this or it's, it's I, 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 I met you at the event. Here's what I, you know, I talked to you about. Our mind doesn't process I because it's self-centered. So I, I teach how to start every email with you, if possible. Dear Hugh, you and I were introduced through Mark. You know, you mentioned a podcast that you were doing. You seem to be in financial services. I might be able to add value. Would love to talk to you further. It's you were, you know, you were here. You and I met. You, I might be able to add value to what you're doing. So just even learning how to invert an email opens up possibilities. And I, and I like telling the story. This is a funny one. I can use his name now. Many years ago, we were trying to do an entertainment platform, trying to take on Facebook. I've done it four times. It hasn't worked, but I keep trying. But we're trying to do an entertainment only 
you know, celebrity platform. There used to be a lot of fake profiles in Facebook and you couldn't yep. find information. New check marks didn't exist. And we wanted a guy, and I was working with a, a friend of mine who'd won four Emmys, created electronic press kits, big in the entertainment industry. The president of ABC was leaving ABC. And I told my friend, John, I throw him under the bus all the time here. And I'm like, John, go get Steve McPherson. I want Steve. So John writes this amazing email like most people would prone to do. My name's John, blah, blah, blah. I, I create electronic press kits. I did 400 movies. I did three paragraphs all about John wanting to meet Steve. I looked at the email. I'm like, absolutely not. I rewrote the email. Basically, I think it was three or four sentences. But here's what it was. Prior to wanting to meet Stephen McPherson, there was an article that had come out. And that article was in the Hollywood Reporter or something. And in that article, Stephen talked about not sure what he was going to do after Disney, wanted to do something in entertainment, wanted to leave a legacy for his daughters, wanted something he could be proud of. So I crafted the email, Dear Mr. McPherson, you were recently featured in the Hollywood Reporter. You mentioned wanting to leave a legacy for something with your daughter. While we haven't met, there's something we have that might be able to help you accomplish your goal. Love to meet. Read the article. You, you, like, might help you accomplish your goal. He wanted something. 17 minutes later, got an email from one of the most powerful guys in Hollywood. Love to. How about Tuesday Coffee Bean Palisades? Great. See you then. Four sentences. Had, had nothing to do with credibility. It was what was important to him. Right. So a lot of times when I'm working with companies and helping my friends in sales or even college kids trying to get a job, you know, I, I teach a lot at UCLA as a guest lecturer and a guy gave me his cover letter about all the great things he thought he would learn from the person. I'm like, I would never hire you. You're, you're, you're talking about all the things I'm supposed to teach you. I'm hiring you to do things for me. Right. I said, go research the company. What does the CEO say are their goals? What are their bonuses? What markets are they trying to get into? How can you add value to the person you'd like to work for? Because that's what's going through his mind is, is what's important to him. How can your goal is you want to get hired, but how do you support the person in their endeavor? What's important to you? That's what you have to figure out is what's important to you. What's in it for you? Then what's in it for me? That was a long winded answer of how I start all my emails with you. But no, but it's, it, it's, but it, that's, that's, it, that's super helpful. Especially love the, uh, the email you sent to the head of ABC, um, you know, very specific, very direct, but it was all about him and you, we see what the result was. Yeah. And, and we could have like, I'm not going to impress him with my background. I'm not in entertainment and my buddy the guy created Dancing with the Stars. He created Desperate Housewives. He doesn't need to meet another guy that's won four. It had nothing to do. It was what's important to him. And so this is one of my little tricks. Sometimes I give the, the secret trick out. Sometimes I don't. Um, I'm here, listening. And this will put you on the spot, Hugh. Do you, have, do you have your five peeps? Do you have anybody really important or famous or in your world or industry you'd love to meet? Yeah, well, yeah, it's funny. I, I actually I read an e I read an article earlier today, and it's about this subject about sending cold emails. And, yeah. and the story was that this gentleman sent an email to Mark Cuban, and he went on his podcast. So I thought to myself, well, if that if this gentleman do it, so can I. So my and you know my end goal of this is to bring on great people to be a resource to others. And why not? Why not craft an, a message saying how, how maybe, you know, this could be helpful to others. And, True. And okay. So Mark's a good example. I could do it right now, but I'm not going to. I, I know Mark. So my trick is, actually, let me just do it while we're talking. I'm just curious how well my technique works. What I do is I say, what's important to Mark Cuban? What's Mark Cuban known for? What's he outspoken on? He ditches passion. Billionaire Mark Cuban ditches passion projects to focus on. There's an article in April 3rd, 2020, 
that specifically says, here's what Mark Cuban's passionate about. So my trick is I sometimes Google what's important to what I want to find out. Hey, what, what's Mark care about? Right. You know, you could write them about anything. Is, is it Shark Tank? Is it, you know, the Maverick? No, there's an article on April 20th that says, here's what he's passionate about right now. You know, so that's one of my little tricks. If you're going to do cold emails is just do some research, right? Research the name of the person and then find out what's important to them. You know, are there charities? Are they, you know, their interests? What's their passion? And I can yeah. tell you, I made a mistake. You want me to share? I like sharing mistakes as well. Uh, please. Uh, yeah. Thanks. So, so this is one of my funny mistakes I like sharing. Um, this was years ago. I don't know how many because I don't look backwards, but a friend of mine, great guy, Scott Elkins is amazing. Scott was the fundraiser for the Lyric Opera in New York and was doing an event and, and I negotiated my way into his event and it was for the Royal Chelsea hospital and it was Bill Clinton, Tony Blair. It was at the home of Julian Robertson, one of the wealthiest men in the world, Tiger yes. hedge fund. And Scott didn't know this till years later. I negotiated part of my access was getting the list of who was going to be there. 78 people. I did my research in advance. You just like I'm saying, what's important to you? I picked who I wanted. I knew Julian Robertson, what he liked with wine, what his charity was. Edward Cottagen from Chelsea, the five Waltons, two of the Picards, Sandy Wilde, Jamie Dimon, Larry Summers from Harvard. Like I've, I've got pictures of Bill Clinton and Larry Summers talking economic theory. I stood there for 20 minutes just like wondering what I'm doing in the room. <laughs> <laughs> but I researched, I knew who I wanted. I had, I step off the elevator at Julian Robertson's house in New York, overlooking Central Park. I say hi to Scott. Thank you so much. Very gracious. I turn and look in the room. In a room like that, there's one thing that they all don't have. You want to know what that one thing is? I'll help you because we don't have time. Name tags. <laughs> And what did I not have in my research? Pictures. I'm standing in a room looking at that time as probably 40, 45 people. I'm like, other than the few, I mean, you recognize Bill Clinton, you recognize right. I don't know who the Waltons are. I mean, I recognize Wendy Dang because I'd seen her picture, but I didn't, I'd never seen Martin Sorrell. I like, I did my research, but I'm in a room without pictures going, what am I going to do now? And it's so, it's such a weird thing when you're in a room like that going, oh, so how are you? Well, who are you? What do you do? <laughs> Edward Cottage and my family started Chelsea in the 1500s. Nice to meet you. Oh, I'm so-and-so Walton. I'm the, you know, not that they're going to say they're the eighth wealthiest person in the world, but you're like, right. oh, nice. To so yeah, I've, even I've made mistakes and learned from them through the years, but, but I did research. I targeted people, figured out what was important. You know, why dad value? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, that's, that's, I, I appreciate that story. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm finding myself do that right now. Um, I'm, I'm reaching out. Uh, just a quick story there. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with the venture capital firm Lux Capital. Um, pretty well known, very philanthropic venture firm. And one of the executives sent a tweet out about two nights ago essentially it was a missive about how, you know, he felt, he felt very, I don't know if badly is the word, but he was very concerned about the environment that we're in this country and the people out of work. And, you know, it was very heartfelt. And I sent him a direct message. I said, you know, this is great. I really appreciate what you just wrote. I'd like you to come on my podcast and talk about it. Who, who did you send it to? Do you have the person's name? I, I can't recall his name, but he's, uh, I could say, I could share with it afterwards. No, it's kind of what I talk about. I have yep. 29,000 people in my database. So as we're talking, I'm like, oh, because if you had said, hey, Stephen, I want Lux Capital, like that's a target. Right. Right. It's not who do you know that's a VC. I know thousands of them. Right. Right. So I went in my database. I pulled up. I've got Zach Shieldhorn from Lux Capital. And I have Shaheen Frashini from Lux Capital Management. They're both luxcapital.com. I have who I met them, how they were introduced, what they were wearing, and what we talked about. 
But again, that's, that's my detail in knowing how to do this, but your right. target was, Oh, I want Lux capital. Do you know so-and-so and somebody like me would say, Oh yeah, I know Zach here. Let me, let me do an email for you. Well, I'm going to take, I'm ta I'm going to, it's committed to memory. I'm going to be taking you up on it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, to your point, it's, you know, that's what people, what, what entrepreneurs, business owners, they need to be doing once they've figured out what that target is in that specific area and how to craft that message. Yeah. Uh, I find that especially nowadays, people, no matter where they are, are very are, are very responsive if you're very direct and specific about it. It doesn't necessarily mean so and so may get back to me, but I've had it happen already with people that I've recorded with that you know I you know I reached out and they were like, "This is great, you know, let's do it." Yeah, and, and that's so I jump back and put this slide up because this one people ask a lot. They're like, "Oh, I'm." Raising money, do you know any VCs? I mean, obviously, I just pulled up two from Lux Capital that I forgot I even knew. Right. I'm like, of course, who do you want? Well, anybody. I'm like, no, VCs don't invest in anybody. No, right. VCs have sectors that they're specific in. Which are the top three to five in your sector? I don't know. I'm like, I can't help you. Like, go, go figure out who are the top ones in your sector. And then within that sector, who are the five best? And within the VC firm, Who's the title or partner? Like which partner has invested in other companies that are similar or who, who's invested in a company where you know somebody, you know, like who are the five people by name that are the ones you want to meet? And then people can help you. If you just right. say, do you know any VCs? Like, yeah, I know thousands, you know, it's like a doctor. Do you know any doctors? Well, yeah, <laughs> but what, like, what's your problem? You know, that's, that's your industry is what's your, what's your problem? All right. Well, here are the five best hospitals for that. And in the hospital, here are the five best, you know, doctors that are the neurologists and here are the five best neurologists. I, I don't want any doctor. Right. I want one of these five. If I got a brain problem, which I probably do, like here are the five guys I want. Do you know these five? So, so this system, this technique can really be used for anything and just kind of teach them you mentally how to structure down, isolate faces, build emotional resonance. Like it's just thousands of hours into these kind of implementable things that I've developed. But, but, and, and thank you for that. That, that, that was really a, a great, a great amount of a, a excellent information. I, I appreciate it. And, and things that people can, can do right away. I mean, this is not, you know, for lack of a better word, brain surgery as far as sending an email, but crafting it in kind of that way you describe is is very important and can yield great results. And it's it's about being detailed and specific. Right. And and again, I've learned I've learned along the way. I, I if we're okay on time, let me give you another entrepreneurial example. Um, Please, I like this one. So again, a lot of the. The, the goal setting I learned when I was 24. So I decided to read five or six books in a row on goal setting. Uh, I reread Think and Grow Rich, which has a, a, a big thing in goals. That's one of the sort of baseline books people like. But I set my goals, this sort of outline of what I wanted. And one of the goals, and I do this a lot with, with college kids and people when I have more time, it's kind of fun. One of my goals was I wanted a company worth a billion dollars when I turned 33. So, I mean, that wasn't my only goal. What would I do with it? What would I do for like, I'm not money motivated. I'm motivation motivated. Cause if I had a lot of money, I'd, I'd like do amazing things for everybody else. That's what would be the cool part. But the day I turned 33 virtual sellers, which was my video team, my company that was the e-commerce was worth, it never quite hit a billion, but it was worth $980 million market cap the day I turned 33. And people are like, oh my God, you made it. You're a billionaire. I'm like, no, there's four things wrong with that. Like, what do you mean? I said, I wasn't specific. The universe gives you exactly what you ask for if you work for it. Right. I say it just miraculously gives it to you. It's like the guy that wants to win the lottery but never buys a ticket. You have to do the work. But I had a company worth a billion dollars, close to it, close enough. And there was four things wrong with it. 
And I, I, again, when I have time, I make the students guess and eventually they might get around to one, but they miss all. You want to know what the four things were that was wrong with that goal? Not specific? Please. Very simple. Anybody that's in money or finance will start laughing at this and they'll get it. Problem one, company worth a billion dollars. So the company's worth X. Stephen was worth Y, me, as in why do I only own 8% of the public company? Like having a company worth that was irrelevant to the percentage of the company that I own. My personal net worth was defined by the percentage I own, not by the company. Right. Mistake one, who cares? Like I needed a personal net worth a lot higher than the, the company could be worth whatever if I hit my target. Problem two, it was public. I was under what's called a 144 restriction. I didn't know what a 144 was. Anybody that's in public <laughs> companies knows you're locked up right. for a year, which means you can't sell your stock for a year. Right. So I'm there. Problem three, there was this thing I had never experienced called a tech bubble. This was March of 99. By March of 2000, when I could, quote, sell, that company wasn't worth that anymore. That market was gone. Right. And four, as an executive, I was under another dirty word I didn't know called a leak out provision, which means even if I wanted to sell it all, I could only sell a certain percent per month as an executive. So my billion dollar company, by the time March 2000 rolled around and I could sell and my, I mean, I did okay, but it, I'm not a billionaire. Right. I asked for the wrong thing. So this aspect of learning how to be specific I, I've, I've learned my own lesson. So when I talk about these techniques, it's not just me going, oh, here, it's academic. It's like, no, I've learned some. They've heard. I, yes. I mean, that, thank you for that story. I mean, that's, uh, you know, again, appreciate your time. That was, uh, the presentation was really great. I think a lot, I mean, the people will tune in and we'll get, we'll learn a great deal about, about your process and how they need to, and how they can apply that to their business. And now's the time where, you know, we need to have some reflection and, and figure out how to evolve and, and move forward um, during, you know, during these times that are, 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 are volatile. Yeah. And, and, and I'll, I'll end with this you. So we're on time. That story I just gave about the, the public company and stuff wasn't for me to impress you with anything. I mean, it didn't, it, it worked, but it didn't. It was to impress upon you earlier when you asked me about the financial independence. Right. It's from mistakes like that where I learned step one was you need to have a specific dollar amount as a target for what your number is for financial independence as a personal net worth in the bank that you can live off of. So these techniques were developed from learning these things and they all kind of overlap and go together and I reset it. And so I'll, I'll end with this real quick. Uh, again, because I do a lot of teaching with kids, I really like it is I say, you know, here's your goals, here's your outline, set your financial targets. And people ask me, they're like, oh, well, what if you don't make it? I, I get asked that. I used to get asked it more. Now I don't get because people think I'm, more wealthy than I am. I still haven't attained my new goals, but I keep trying. But one, I, I look at him, Hugh, and I say, here's the deal. If I make it, every day of the life, every company I start tries to add value to other people. Right. My companies I build, I want to help other people be successful at what they're already doing. That's one of the tenets. Even if I spin it as enterprise software helps you get your bonus to send your kids to school, it still helps you. Right. I want you to buy from me, but it helps you. But I say, hey, if I make it, I get to retire my parents early. I get to send my niece and nephew to school. I'm not even giving them money. I'm buying them a building that's going to give them income. They can't get the building till they're older because I don't want to give them too much money. But I, like I've thought through all of it. If I get right. to do all this, I'll take my friends on soccer trips. I'll get to do amazing things. My life will be amazing of what I can do for others. But if I fail, and I might, I can always go get a job and I'll be just like you. Because most of the people when you're an entrepreneur are telling you, what if you don't make it, don't have anything that you want. So we listen to the wrong people. If I don't make it, it's okay. Every day of my life is around building companies that I love doing, helping others, 
in the life and lifestyle I want, the worst thing for me would be to go have a job. Well, that's a, a great note to, uh, to conclude everything. Stephen, uh, thank you again for taking the time. I really appreciate it. I know um, our subscribers and our listeners will get, learn a great deal about you know, your process and kind of what has brought you here today. And we'll really we'll have learned a great deal about you know steps that they can take to really better themselves going forward. Perfect. I, I appreciate you. And, and up on my little you know placard behind me, anybody that wants that presentation or the full one or just wants a lot of the content, the the bullseyeguy.com is the primary website. Podcasts are out there. A lot of this stuff, like I said, I've I put out in podcast form to translate and duplicate and share that in, information. I'm not selling it. I'm not a consultant. I have my own companies, but I like giving back and, and that's how I do it. So anybody has questions can get a hold of me if you want the content or the presentations. Just let me know and I'll get it to you. Thank you, Stephen. That, that's, that's what we're here to do at Money Talks is to, is to be a resource, to bring on people that want to be a resource to others because that's how you know, everyone can, can move forward in, this, in these times and accomplish their goals. You know, there's clearly a lot of risk and, and uncertainty in the environment. And that's what we do here is provide those resources to protect against that, that uncertainty. So again, I want to thank you everyone for tuning in. Please, you know, subscribe to our Money Talks channel, smash that like button. Uh, thank you again, Stephen, for your time. And just remember, Money Talks, have a great day. Thank you. Thanks.